the writings in this volume, and I know some of you have uh, had a chance to look into it, uh, by blacks and whites, men and women, Washington political leaders, ordinary citizens in the post-war South, allow readers to experience firsthand the fateful attempt in the wake of the Civil War to implement full freedom and constitutional equality for African Americans and what became of that attempt. It's a story that resonates today of a reckless and emotionally volatile president, eventually impeached, deadly domestic terrorism, black lives taken with impunity, coordinated voter suppression, and fierce debates over the nature of citizenship. The Americans who speak to us through this book will take your breath away with their nobility, their hope, their righteous anger, and their heroic defiance in the face of horrifying racial violence. They, together, they testify in a way that's lost none of its urgency to our greatest American aspirations and to our grimmest American realities. Uh, Reconstruction, and uh, Eric Boehner and I were talking about this just before uh, in the, during the reception, remains one of the most misunderstood periods in American history. Um, and W.B. W. Du Bois, uh, 80 years ago in his book Black Reconstruction, suggests one reason for that. He wrote, one cannot study Reconstruction without first frankly facing the facts of universal lying. And it's, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, lies, uh, misconceptions, bordering on, on fantasy, really. I remember my own high school history textbook um, with its uh, descriptions of thieving carpetbaggers and clownishly corrupt black legislators, uh, all you know, complete with uh, illustrations straight out of a minstrel show. Um, that was in the you know mid mid sixties mid 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 sixties. Um, the widespread reluctance to face a more complex and bitter truth proves how very much alive the passions around emancipation and reconstruction have remained, as alive as last summer's violence in Charlottesville, for example, and how tied all of this still is to American politics and to explosive questions of American identity. And this is all to say that we need to understand this era to understand how to live in the present. No one has done more to help us understand it than acclaimed historian Eric Foner, DeWitt Clinton Professor of History at Columbia University. His prize-winning books include Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, The Fiery Trial, Abraham Lincoln and American Slavery, and most recently, appropriately enough, uh, Battles for Freedom, the Use and Abuse of American History. He is editor of the Library of America series volume number 76, The Writings of Thomas Paine. Please welcome Eric Foner. I should start by just commending Brooke Simpson, the uh, editor of this uh, excellent volume that's just being published on Reconstruction. By all rights, Brooks should really be here talking about Reconstruction, but Brooks is in Arizona, and I'm on the Upper West Side. So the Library of America, apart from its literary uh, aspirations, also understands the value of a dollar, and um, <laughs> it was a lot less expensive to bring me here uh, than Brooks. But nonetheless, I commend him for putting together a really excellent uh, kaleidoscope, really, of all sorts of voices from Congress down to ordinary black and white people in the South uh, from that uh, very controversial and, as you said, often misunderstood uh, era. Um, I was, what, I was uh, reading an interview recently with uh, Ron Chernow, who uh, you all know uh, just wrote this, published this book about Ulysses S. Grant, which is on the bestseller list and which I commend for bringing a more modern, up-to-date view of Reconstruction to a broad audience, uh, you know, the, more than probably most of our academic historians reach. Um, but Chernow said that, he said, you know, as I've been writing this book on President Grant, I encounter more and more people who are really interested and expert on the Civil War and yet know nothing about Reconstruction. Now, having published a 600-page book on Reconstruction, I found this disheartening. 
But um, the fact is that, uh, as Max sort of alluded to, even though many people don't really know much about that period after the Civil War, um, it is still uh, part of our lives today. Many of the issues on the front pages of our newspapers are Reconstruction issues. Who is a citizen? Who should be a citizen? That's a Reconstruction question. The right to vote, controversial today, controversial during Reconstruction. Um, federalism, the, the relative powers of the states and the federal government <coughs> debated actively in Reconstruction, still controversial today. Terrorism was a phenomenon of Reconstruction, not, home, not, not uh, foreign terrorism from abroad, but homegrown, good old American terrorism by groups like the Ku Klux Klan and uh, similar uh, organizations. And every uh, session, every uh, year of the Supreme Court um, includes cases in which, which require the interpretation of the Reconstruction constitutional amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, especially the 14th Amendment, which is always sort of up for grabs in, uh, in the Supreme Court. So my point is really that you can't understand America today without knowing something about that period of Reconstruction which followed the American uh, Civil War. One other important point about Reconstruction, which again Max alluded to here, is that um, Reconstruction is a perfect example of what we call the politics of history. I'm not, I'm not talking about whether the historian is a Republican or a Democrat, uh, more it's how the world, the time the historian is writing influences historical scholarship and vice versa, how the writings of historians help to shape people's conceptions of their own society. Now I could give you a long lecture here on historiography, but that would quickly put people to sleep. Um, historiography, changing interpretations of history. But Reconstruction is a very important example of this. For more than 50 years, really, what we call the Dunning School, named after my, one of my predecessors a long time ago at Columbia University, William A. Dunning, who taught the Civil War Reconstruction at Columbia around the turn of the century and trained graduate students who wrote about Reconstruction. The Dunning School dominated historical scholarship and popular understanding for a long, long period of time. In a very quick nutshell, what they taught and what your textbook and my high school textbook pervade was that Reconstruction was sort of the lowest point in the whole saga of American democracy, a period of misgovernment and corruption um, that at the end of the Civil War, President Lincoln wanted to bring the defeated South back into the Union in as lenient and quick a uh, pr process as possible. Um, his successor, according to this view, Andrew Johnson, uh, after Lincoln's assassination, uh, continued Lincoln's policy, but was thwarted by the sort of evil villains of the peace, the radical Republicans in Congress, bent on vengeance against the South and uh, partisanship of the Republican Party. They imposed black suffrage, that is the right to vote for black men, most of whom were former slaves, on the defeated Confederacy. The result was this orgy of misgovernment presided over by a, a sort of trio of the former slaves, carpetbaggers, that is northerners who went down to the south to reap the spoils of office, according to this view, and the so-called scalawags, who were white southerners who abandoned their race in order to cooperate with these governments. Eventually, patriotic groups like the Ku Klux Klan organized in order to overthrow these Reconstruction governments and restore what was politely called home rule or what we would call white supremacy uh, in the defeated, uh, in, in the um, southern states. Um, now, what do I mean by the politics of history? This view, as I say, dominated historical scholarship into the 1960s. It also reached a wide audience through films like Birth of a Nation, which many of you are aware of, which had its premiere in Woodrow Wilson's White House. 
a great bestseller of the 1920s, The Tragic Era by Claude Bowers, and many, many other books that Du Bois complained of in his great work, Black Reconstruction in America. Um, but there were modern day political lessons in this view of Reconstruction. It wasn't just an ap academic abstraction. The first lesson was it was a giant mistake to give black people the right to vote. Therefore, the white South was justified in taking away the right to vote from black people, which they did around 1900, and, and most of the black population of the South remained disenfranchised until 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. If blacks were given the right to vote again, you'd have another replay of the horrors of Reconstruction, according to this view. Second of all, Reconstruction was imposed on the South by the North. Maybe some of those people were even sort of humanitarians with good motives, but the result showed that outsiders just don't understand Southern race relations. And therefore, the white South should resist outside complaints about race, the race system in the South, which began to get more and more prominent as the 20th century went on. In 1944, Gunnar Myrdal, in his influential book, An American Dilemma, said that when pressed upon the racial inequality of their society, white Southerners will always revert to Reconstruction. Well, look what happened when black people had equality. We can't let that happen again. And finally, and this is somewhat arcane nowadays, this view of Reconstruction was part of this sort of edifice of what used to be the solid Democratic South. Reconstruction was created by the Republican Party. If white Southerners were ever tempted to vote Republican, they would face again a replay of the so-called horrors of Reconstruction. So in other words, there were powerful political lessons in this academic scholarship on Reconstruction. Well, anyway, when the Civil Rights Movement took place in the 1960s, and by the way, the Civil Rights Movement is frequently called the Second Reconstruction. I think it was C. Van Woodward, the historian who coined that phrase. Um, when the Civil Rights Movement th took place, this interpretation fell to the ground. The, the pillar, which was black inferiority, was no longer intellectually or politically legitimate. And historians began to reinterpret Reconstruction. Many, many excellent historians did that. And today, I think it's fair to say that most historians view Reconstruction as a tragedy, like Bowers said in the tragic era. But the tragedy was not that it was attempted, but that it failed and left to future generations this very difficult problem of racial justice. Um, and I played a part in this reinterpretation in my book on Reconstruction. Simpson has played a part in his writings and this book of documents certainly gives us a very broad range of views from the time period about what was going on. Well, to understand the how Reconstruction represented a radical change in American history, you have to very quickly remind ourselves of what was the status of African Americans, let's say, on the eve of the Civil War, 1860. In that year, there were about four million slaves in the United States. There were also half a million free blacks, four million slaves. Slavery was by far the most important economic institution in the country. Slave owners had controlled the federal government for most of the period from the Constitution to the Civil War. Unlo uh, contrary to what many people seem to believe, slavery was not going away. It was thriving. It was growing. It was expanding. There were, it was profitable. There were more slaves in the United States in 1860 than in any other moment in our entire history. But slavery shaped the whole conception of American nationality before the Civil War. On the eve of the Civil War, 1857, the Supreme Court in the famous Dred Scott decision ruled that no black person could be a citizen. Citizenship was just for white people. Blacks were aliens. They were not part of what Chief Justice Roger Tawney called the American family. They had, as he said in his infamous opinion, they had no rights which a white man is bound to respect. And this was the dominant view in white America in the pre-Civil War period. The only people who put forward a different vision, 
of an America where citizenship and rights were severed from a connection with race was the abolitionist movement, black and white, which put forward this other view of that anybody born in the United States is a citizen, whatever their race, and that all citizens ought to enjoy basic equality before the law. That view was written into our laws and constitution during the Reconstruction uh, period. Um, how did that happen? Well, you know, Lincoln was assassinated, as we all know, and succeeded by Andrew Johnson. Um, Johnson has a claim, I think, to being considered the worst president in American history. There are contenders, other contenders, for that title, but Johnson is a strong claimant. He lacked all of the elements, all the qualities of greatness that Lincoln had. He, he was stubborn. He was deeply, deeply racist. He was unable to work with Congress. He had no sense of Northern public sentiment. Johnson set up Reconstruction governments in the South. This is in 1865, after the war ended, completely controlled by whites, with blacks enjoying virtually no rights whatsoever. And these governments went on to pass laws which we call the Black Codes. They're represented in the book, uh, which basically tried to use the power of the state governments to force African Americans back to work on the plantations. They made it illegal if, for blacks not to sign a labor contract to work with a white person. If you wanted to work for yourself, forget it. You were violating the law if you were black. Um, and you could be fined, imprisoned, or literally auctioned off to work for someone who would pay your fine. These black codes alarmed people in the North. They thought that the southern states were trying to reinstitute not exactly slavery, but something that was certainly not real freedom. And it led, to, it led Congress, when they convened in early 1866, to enact one of the most important laws in American history, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 the first federal law to actually use the term civil rights and the first to define who was a citizen and what rights they ought to enjoy. It began by saying anybody born in the United States is a citizen of the United States, with the exception of Native Americans, because they're still considered citizens of their tribal sovereignties. Um, but that, anybody, and that is, you know, that's a principle which is still with us today. It is written into the Constitution in the 14th Amendment, birthright citizenship. And it is one of those things. There's a lot of talk, you know, about American exceptionalism, all the things that make American exceptional. I mean, we are exceptional. We're the only country in the world any idiot can walk into a, a store and buy an AK-47 <laughs> and start shooting everybody that he feels like. That's Second Amendment. You know, we're exceptional in that regard. But. Um, this is a real example. There is no country in Europe today that recognizes birthright citizenship. No country in Europe. There, in fact, Canada does. Very few countries in the world do. It, it is a statement that anybody can be an American. It doesn't matter what your race is. It doesn't matter what your religion is. It doesn't matter what your national origin is. And it doesn't matter, and this is where the current thing, it doesn't matter what the status of your parents are. Brooks is in a state, Arizona, a very strange place. I've been there <laughs> with a round trip ticket. Um, <laughs> where they don't understand that the civil rights law is still on the books, that the 14th Amendment is actually part of the Constitution, and they don't believe in birthright citizenship. They think that the child born in the United States of a undocumented or illegal immigrant should not be a citizen. But that's ridiculous. That the, it's very clear. Anybody born in the state. Your parents can be a bank robber, and you're a citizen of the United States. If your parents have violated the law by coming in, that doesn't matter. So that's a critical point about Reconstruction, establishing this severing citizenship from race, which is a complete repudiation of the actual history of the United States up to that point. But then the Civil Rights Act goes on to say the rights that all these citizens must enjoy, and it lists a bunch of them, what we really call the rights of free labor, the right to sign a contract, the right to go to court, the right to own property, the right to testify, sue, be sued, the rights that are necessary to compete in the labor market as a free person. 
And it also says, very interestingly, that all citizens must enjoy these rights the same as a white person. Very interesting, unusual language. Before the Civil War, putting the word white into a law was a boundary of exclusion. Only white people can vote. Now, whiteness becomes the baseline. If white people have these rights, others have to have the same rights. Equality before the law, something that had never existed for black people before the Civil War. Well, Andrew Johnson vetoes the Civil Rights Act. It becomes the, most, the first significant law in American history to be passed over the veto of a president. But any a law can easily be repealed by the next Congress. So very quickly, Congress puts these principles into the Constitution in the 14th Amendment, the most important change in the Constitution since the Bill of Rights in 1791. Uh, I'm not gonna, the 14th Amendment is long, complicated, in some passages almost impossible to understand, but the core of it is the first section, which again says anyone born in the United States is a citizen, and then talks about their rights, but not in terms of specific rights, like the Civil Rights Act, but more general principles. All citizens, everybody has, has the right to enjoy the privileges and immunities of citizens, whatever those are. And then, interestingly, in terms of the current, the present day, any pers all persons must enjoy equality before the law. Not just citizens, aliens too, anybody in the United States, non-citizens. Equality before the law and due process of law. I've, I'm not a lawyer, I, some, I know some lawyers, I try to avoid them, but uh, I'm not a lawyer. So that gives me carte blanche to say whatever I want about the Constitution and the law. But I feel that those courageously defending the rights of, you know, these dreamers, people threatened with deportation from this country, need to say, need to go back, do more with the 14th Amendment, which clearly distinguishes certain rights only citizens have, but other basic rights available to everybody, whether citizen or not. Um, anyway, the 14th Amendment puts this concept of equality into the Constitution for the first time. The word equal does not appear in the original Constitution except where it's talking about like each state has to have an equal number of senators or something like that. The 14th Amendment makes the Constitution what it became in the 20th, late 20th century and still is in a way today, uh, which is a vehicle that uh, to, to which people who feel they're being denied equality can appeal to. You couldn't do that before the Civil War. The Constitution had nothing to do with equality before the Civil War. And the language is non-racial. It doesn't, the first section doesn't say anything about race. This is about everybody in the United States, and that is, has had momentous consequences. Maybe the most important 14th Amendment decision of the last seven or eight years was the one legalizing gay marriage, or that is to say, barring states from discriminating in marriage between different kinds of citizens. That's a 14th Amendment decision. Now, people in 1866 were not thinking about gay marriage. That was not an issue in the politics of Reconstruction. But Justice Kennedy, who wrote that decision, said, you know, our concepts of liberty and equality evolve. What it means today is not the same thing as it meant in 1866, and we have to use the Constitution to deal with or to respond to these evolving ideas of freedom. So uh, without the 14th Amendment, we would not have gone at, come as close as we may have done to genuine equality for uh, all kinds of Americans. Now, none of these measures that I mentioned had anything to do with the right to vote. That comes in 1867, when Congress gets so fed up with President Johnson and the governments he has created that they decide they gotta have new governments in the South with black men having the right to vote. That the only way to protect them from this kind of oppression which Southern states are imposing on them is to give them the right to vote. And so you get what we call radical reconstruction. The Reconstruction Act of 1867, again, passed over the veto of President Johnson which 
calls for the creation of new governments in the South with what they called at the time manhood suffrage. That is, all men, regardless of race, voting. Now, of course, the women's movement, which was very vocal at this time, was very disappointed by this. They were fighting for women's suffrage as well. They did not, it's not that they opposed manhood suffrage, but they thought it was completely inadequate. And um, they, were, they were very disappointed. And then Congress put this principle into the Constitution in the 15th Amendment, which bars the states from denying anyone the right to vote because of race. In other words, black men must have the right to vote the same as anyone else. But you can deny them the right to vote because of sex. And of course, every state at that time did. And it wasn't until 50 years later that the uh, women's suffrage amendment gets added uh, to the Constitution. But radical reconstruction, or the enfranchisement of black men, launches this period we call radical reconstruction, when for the first time in our history, or actually the first time in any history, biracial governments came to power in the South, biracial democracy, with black and white Americans enjoying political power, African American men serving in public office for the first time in our history, there were two black senators in Reconstruction, 16 members of the House of Representatives, hundreds and hundreds served in state legislatures, in local offices like Justice of the Peace and school board official and sheriff. And you had actually, as I said, a functioning, um, a functioning biracial uh, democracy. Um, this was a real challenge to the long tradition which went under the phrase, very common in 19th century politics, this is a white man's government. Now it wasn't a white man's government. Whites dominated most of the Reconstruction governments, but still there were many, many African Americans enjoying genuine political. In fact, I would have to say, even though there are more black officials today than there were in Reconstruction, African Americans probably enjoyed more actual political power in Reconstruction than they do today in most places in the United States. Um, and those governments, you know, they were, no, they were not nirvana, they were not utopia. There was corruption in the South, absolutely. But, you know, I'm a, Trump is a America first, I'm a New York first kind of person. We are number one. In corruption, the South had nothing on us. <laughs> this is the period of the Tweed Ring, you know, the whiskey scandals, the Indian frauds, Credit Mobilier, this was an era of corruption. Largely because, because of the Civil War, immense amounts of money were passing through the government for the first time, and they kind of stuck to people's fingers. Um, <laughs> the point is, there was corruption in the South, but it was not caused by giving black men the right to vote. How do you explain the Tweed Ring? There were hardly any blacks in New York City. So, but the propaganda and then the history began to say, well, if you give blacks the right to vote, you get corruption. But, you know, th that is absurd, obviously, if you look at the history of this era, North and South. But apart from that, there were many achievements of these governments. They began the process of economic rebuilding. They established the first public school system. Only North Carolina had had a public school system before the Civil War. For white people, forget about blacks, they didn't want to educate them. But there were no public school systems for whites in the South before the Civil War. Now they're created by these Reconstruction governments. These states passed civil rights legislation trying to make sure that African Americans were treated equally in public accommodations and transportation, uh, et cetera. So it was a rem remarkable era of democracy. But of course, the problems of former slaves were not just political, they were economic as well. They came out of slavery with no wherewithal, no property. They had hoped for and wanted, as the phrase goes, 40 acres and a mule. They wanted the government to distribute land to them as a kind of, if you want to use the term, reparations. That word wasn't really part of politics back then, but you know, Lincoln in his second inaugural address talked about the 250 years of unrequited, unpaid labor of the slave. That was the cause of the Civil War, said Lincoln. You know, in the second inaugural, a magnificent speech, 
Lincoln said, let us get serious, I'm paraphrasing, let us get serious here, folks, he said. Everybody knows that slavery is the cause of the Civil War. You know, there's nothing even to debate about that. Nowadays, a lot of people don't know it, but they all knew it in 1865. But Lincoln said 250 years of unpaid labor. What is our responsibility for that? Well, Black said, your responsibility is to give us some of that wealth that we have created. But of course, it didn't happen. Land was not distributed. You, what you might say is under Reconstruction, the political revolution went forward, but the economic revolution did not. But the political revolution was revolutionary enough that it inspired a wave, as I said, of terrorist violence in the South. The Klan and other groups, the White League, the Knights of the White Committee, they were, all, they were local organizations all over the place. But they were all basically devoted to using violence to restore white supremacy. They used assassination, arson, assault. It's a melancholy fact that probably more American citizens were killed by the Klan and such groups in Reconstruction than Osama bin Laden managed to kill. So it was not a small scale uh, problem. Um, and eventually, these Reconstruction governments, one by one, were overthrown partly because of violence in the South, but also because of a retreat in the North from this principle of equality. By the 1870s, partly stimulated by a deep economic depression, which began in 1873, um, Northerners began to lose interest in Reconstruction. Some of them began to say, you know, these Southern whites are right. I don't know if blacks really can be involved in government. Uh, these governments seem to be corrupt, something like that. And eventually, in 18 77, as part of the settlement of the disputed election of 1876, um, Republican and Democratic national leaders reached a deal, the compromise or the bargain of 1877, in which fundamentally, this is a quick little explanation of a big, a much more complicated thing, Republicans retained control of the national government, but the entire South was now under the control of the old, of the Democratic Party. In that retreat and subsequently, uh, I have to say the Supreme Court played a significant role. Decision by decision, whittling away at the Reconstruction constitutional amendments. I, I could give you a whole litany of cases. I won't, you know, Slaughterhouse, Crookshank, civil rights cases, Plessy. Actually, one that's probably not widely known I think it's 1903, Giles v. Harris, 1903, a case that came out of Alabama. At that point, all the southern states were taking the right to vote away from blacks. They couldn't do it by just law saying black people can't vote because the 15th Amendment said you can't deny the right to vote because of race. So they did it through ostensibly race-neutral provisions like poll taxes, literacy tests, understanding clauses. But the way they were administered was to exclude all the blacks from voting. And a black citizen of Alabama sued on the grounds that he and others were being deprived of their rights, went all the way to the Supreme Court. In Giles v. Harris, the Supreme Court said, look, we can't do anything about this. If the white population of Alabama is bent on depriving black people of the right to vote, even though it's guaranteed in the Constitution, there is nothing the Supreme Court can do. They just threw up their hands. And that was kind of a carte blanche, a you know, green light to do anything you wanted. And the Supreme Court was just not going to enforce the United States Constitution. But the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments remained. They were not repealed. They remained there. As Charles Sumner, the great senator from Massachusetts, said, sleeping giants in the Constitution. Eventually, they would be reawakened during the Civil Rights Revolution, the second Reconstruction. You know, when, when um, South Africa abolished apartheid in the 1990s, they had to write an entirely new Constitution. We didn't, the Civil Rights Movement in this country did not produce any change in our Constitution. What they needed was just for the Constitution we already had to be enforced. 
which it had not been for 50 or 75 years. And once it was, things began to change uh, in this country. So let me just finish by saying that one of the lessons of this story is that, um, you know, our history is not, as some people like to think, a straight line of greater and greater freedom, greater and greater rights, but a much more complicated and much more interesting story of ups and downs, of rights gained and then lost and have to be fight fought for another day. At the end of the Civil War, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, a abolitionist from Massachusetts who commanded one of the early units of black soldiers in the Civil War, Higginson said, um, revolutions may go backward. Reconstruction was a revolution which went backward, but, um, but it laid the groundwork for future struggles which have occurred in our lifetime. And um, one might almost say that, you know, I, I define Reconstruction in two ways. One, a specific time period, usually dated 1865 to 1877, that's how Simpson basically sees it. But another way of defining Reconstruction is as a historical process, the process by which the United States tried to come to terms with the consequences of the abolition of slavery. And if that's your definition, in some sense, Reconstruction never ended because we're still 150 years after the end of the Civil War still trying to come to terms with the consequences of the abolition of slavery for this country. So let me stop there. And as I said, we have a little time for questions, comments. So let me just invite you to um, Thank you very much.